Welcome once again. It's good to see you all. And today we're going to talk about an abundant life. Because, you know, we've been studying the sign of the Son of Man. And we review this very often so that you can become familiar with the different points on, in the sign. So we've been following the course of this comet, which is the, called the Comet K2 for short. <laughs> and from the time of the beginning of the sign of the Son of Man, we have the time of the Exodus from Egypt, corresponds to that time. And then the baptism in the Red Sea. And then what was this point? Pentecost, the going up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments for the first time. And then we had Yom Kippur. That was when Moses went back up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments again because they had broken the Ten Commandments in the first time when they built the or made the golden calf. So last time we talked especially about these two points, looking at how the law was given at Sinai, and then their sins were forgiven, and this represents the law being written in our hearts. We recognized Christ in the first table of stones, the first tables of stone, because they were, uh, they were cut out of the stone by God and given to Moses complete, just as Christ was the Son of God. Whereas the second time, Moses had to carve out the stone himself. But God wrote with his own finger still in that same stone, the Ten Commandments. So it represents our sinful flesh, our humanity, but still with the law of God written with his finger, but in our hearts. I want you to see that contrast again today, and we're going to make this practical. At least that's my goal. I want you to have a practical understanding of what this actually looks like. How do we live with the heart written with the law written in our hearts. So let's look at Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8. Now this is when they're preparing for God to come down on the mountain and with all of the thundering and lightning and fire and smoke and the trumpet sound and God thundered out the Ten Commandments. They were preparing for that and Moses had gathered the people together and told them everything that God had commanded him. And then the people answered. Exodus 19 verse 8 and all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So the people 
made an agreement with God, and they said, okay, no problem, you've given us your law, your Ten Commandments, and all of the other laws as well. And they said, yes, everything you've said, we will do it. Excellent. Did they? <laughs> it sounds great, <laughs> but did they do it? This was the first time when Moses went up the mountain. And he was there for how long? 40 days. Quite a while, at least by our standards, to be gone for more than a month. And then they said, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. And what did they do? Did they do all that the Lord has spoken? No. They broke the law. You know the story. So, then, looking back at the sign, that was the story connected with this point in the sign, as we've explained before. Then came Yom Kippur. Day of Judgment. Now, this was a special day for Israel. Yes, it was a day of judgment, but it was more than that. It was a day of atonement. Atonement means bringing us into union in this context with God. There's, there's a verse in Isaiah, chapter 1, and verse 18. And this was applicable to that day. He's referring to the things that happened on that day. He says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins... Be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, white wool. So, what makes something red? What is red connected with, especially for the ancient people? Blood, exactly. So, why would one's sins be red? What, what, how, what do sins have to do with blood? Well, they called for a sacrifice. And the reason is because all sin leads to death. It leads to blood being lost. So that's why the sins are red, because it's, you have blood on you through sin. When we sin, we have our blood, our own blood, on us. We're guilty, in other words. Just like in... In the Garden of Eden, God said, in the day that you eat the fruit, we could say, in the day that you sin, you will die. So, sin always comes with death. Paul says in, in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But on Yom Kippur, it was a day of cleansing. Though your sins be as scarlet, though they are red, they will be white. What does white represent? Righteousness, purity, holiness, those divine characteristics that come from God, 
they shall be like wool. Interesting comparison. Where does wool come from? Sheep. And of course, Jesus was identified as the Lamb of God. From him we get the wool. So this is what was represented on Yom Kippur. And that's why it was a good day for Israel. Because their sins would be cleansed on that day. That day was all about going in and cleansing everything in the sanctuary from all of that blood where the sin had had been transferred. Every time somebody would confess their sins, the animal would be slain, the blood would be carried into the temple, into the tabernacle. And then on this day, they would clean it all up, essentially, in the ceremonial way. And Jesus said, In John chapter 10 and verse 10, he gave us a contrast. He said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus came to take away our sin and to give us life and that we might have it, have that life more abundantly. What does that mean? Well, I think it's relatively straightforward, but we will see an example of that as we continue. But just briefly, last week we talked about this representing a certain group of people. What group was that? Who did we say has the law written in their hearts? Christians, yes. That the 144,000 especially are the ones who keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we saw last week how in 10 constellations of the sign, there's the pattern of the 10 Commandments, the first table with the first four commandments, and then the second table with the other six commandments. And we saw how the symbolism of these different constellations all points to different aspects that are in harmony with the specific commandments that fit that pattern. And then we saw the uh, the promise that Jesus gave in Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus said that, uh, I think it's 321, thank you. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And that's what we saw here. We have Jesus sitting on his throne like the Ark of the Covenant was the throne a box with the mercy seat. It was actually a throne, and above that throne was the Shekinah glory. 
the glory of God that shined above the throne. And Jesus is sitting on his throne. And inside that throne was the Ten Commandments. And that's what we see there. Then we also see somebody sitting next to him on his throne. And so we can relate that to this verse. Those who overcome, he will grant to sit with him on his throne. That's what we see here. Sitting with him on his throne. Those who overcome, those who have the law written in the heart. And that was our scripture reading in Revelation chapter 14. You know that this is, it's actually prophesied where this message would come from. And it's here in this passage. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion. The lamb is Jesus, of course, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their forehead. Some versions also include uh, the son's name as well. And in the sign of the Son of Man. We've talked about how this represents his name, the Alpha and the Omega, referring to Alnitak of Orion. And it's also even the name of the Father, if you extend the principle the next star is the star that would correspond to the Father. And it's also an A. It starts with the letter A or Alpha in Greek being al Lam of Orion. So it has, it's pointing to this sign being the name of the Father and the name of the Son. But continuing, it gives a description of the place on earth where this name is given. He says in verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. Now, where... Do you hear a voice of many waters and great thunder at the same time? What kind of a place are you visiting if you hear a lot of water and a great thunder? A waterfall, exactly. A big waterfall. Many waters. And when the waters fall over uh, in a waterfall, they make a loud, thunderous sound. All right. So, we know that it's pointing to a waterfall. The question is, what waterfall? There are many waterfalls all throughout the world. What part of the world has a waterfall? Okay, it's not a small waterfall because this is a waterfall with Many waters, and that's actually significant. Many waters. Who can tell me? Maybe some of the locals know. What does Iguazu mean? What is the meaning of that name? Agua Grande. Many waters. There it is, right there in the Bible. Many waters referring to a waterfall because it has the voice of a great thunder and where is Iguazu Falls? Not too far from here. Yes. Amen. That's a good point because 
this, uh, the, the many waters, it means a lot of water. It doesn't mean a great height of water. That's not what this is talking. It's talking about the quantity. And of course, Iguazu Falls is right up there with the world's greatest waterfalls in terms of the quantity. I think it is the, the world's largest waterfall in terms of the amount of water that is flowing over the Iguazu Falls. Therefore, it's called Iguazu, many waters, great waters. But that's not the only indication. Let's continue the verse. And I heard, so he heard first the voice of waters and the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Hmm. What does Paraguay have to do with harps? Do you know? <laughs> hmm? Yeah, it, uh, that's, that's the instrument, the harp. Yes. But it's also known in Paraguay, it is the national instrument of Paraguay is the harp. So it's not just about the waterfalls, which are shared with Brazil and Bolivia, but originally they were, they belonged to Paraguay. But it's also about the harpers harping with their harps. And that refers to the uh, harp being the national instrument of Paraguay. And this is a monument to the harp that was erected not long ago this year on May 28th, which was, I believe it was the 28th, which was Pentecost. So erected right at that time when when the comets were crossing right there, right at Pentecost. And because it's the national instrument of Paraguay, they built a monument for it, very large, and it can be seen from the sky. You can see its form from the lands, and also there's a river right there from which you can see it from the water. It's also in Paraguay, where in 2013, they made the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest harp ensemble in the world. 400 and some harpers, all harping together. The harpers harping with their harps. That happened in 2013. So it points directly to here, to this land, where, what would happen? Verse 3, they, who is they? It's referring to the 144,000 of verse 1. The 144,000 sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. Now, this is symbolism. We'll see what that new song is in just a second. They sung a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. What's that a reference to? The four beasts and the, the elders, the 24 elders, that points to Orion. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. And let's read verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits. So they're not the only redeemed, but they're the first fruits unto God 
and to the Lamb. So what is this harp and the song that the 144,000 play? It goes back to the Ten Commandments in the sign. That's the setting of these verses. We saw how the name of God was written in their foreheads. Here's the name of God and his character is, that's what the name symbolizes. One's name in the Bible symbolizes character, their character. So the Ten Commandments represents God's character. And that's what we see in the sign. And you can see our video from last week to learn about uh, the, that correspondence. But then we have the, the rhinoceros or the unicorn, but in the Bible, a unicorn represents a, or means a rhinoceros. And that represents the 144,000. And they have their father's name, the law, his Ten Commandments, written in their foreheads. So what is the song? Well, there is a verse in the Bible, Psalm 33, verse 2. David says, praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Hmm. Interesting. So he's talking about playing music, singing a song, using a harp, which the psaltery is just another name for a harp. Psalm 144, verse 9, I will sing a new song unto thee. So this is referring directly to what we see in Revelation. They sung a new song. Only the 144,000 could learn that song. And they sing it upon a psaltery, which is a harp. It's a, a hand harp. In the ancient times, they didn't have the harp, big one like we use today. But it was just a, a handheld Harp, we'll see a picture of that in a moment. And it's an instrument of ten strings. And on that instrument, he would, they would sing praises to God. So when we connect that with the sign, and we see that there are ten commandments, And we want to connect that to a harp, but again, not this kind of a harp, but this kind. I've merged this with the sign on its side. This is the handheld harp of ten strings that David was talking about. And you can see it has the same basic shape of the bottom half of the sign in this orientation because that's where the Ten Commandments are represented in the sign. So this harp of ten strings is directly connected to the Ten Commandments, playing praises to God by keeping the Ten Commandments learning that song of keeping the commandments, but not keeping the commandments according to what ancient Israel said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's not how they played the song, but they learned, one moment, they learned the, the song which is described in Revelation 12. In the end, it talks about 
the war between the dragon and the woman. And the dragon went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of who? Of Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes it possible because he writes the law in the heart. So it's his testimony. It's his writing. Yes. Uh-huh. Amen. I think that's very nice. We have the rhinoceros there, which we looked at last week in, in the book of Job, how God challenges Job and says, hey, can you make the rhinoceros plow your fields for you? And he, it, you're, you're connecting that with this as the yoke. Just like we talked about last week, being under Christ's yoke. His yoke is easy. His burden is light because he does all the heavy lifting and we just kind of walk along with him. Notice again in Revelation, the same passage there. Revelation 14.4, they follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. That means they're yoked together with Jesus, with the Lamb. Amen. Thank you for that thought. So, again, in the sign, we have this contrast between the law that, was, that the people said, all you have said we will do, but they didn't do it because they were trying to do it in their own strength. Without Christ, they wanted to, they, they committed to keeping the law, but they didn't have Christ. And so it naturally failed and very quickly. But at Yom Kippur, it was a different situation. And it represented that this case today, the 144,000, the last generation, who do have the law written in the hearts. So what does that look like? Now there's one place, surely more, but there's one place that I want to look at today that illustrates this principle. It's a character in the Bible that we're familiar with. And in the book of Job, we have his story. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So Job has a good report. And it describes his situation. And then it also describes how he would intercede. It was so when the days, this is verse 5, when the days of their feasting, that is uh, in verse 4, his sons, they would feast in their houses Everyone in his day, that's referring to his birthday. Everyone in their birthday, they would feast in their houses. And Job, and they called their sisters to eat and drink with them. But Job was concerned. And so he sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So Job, we would say in, in our modern terms, we would say he prayed for them. He interceded with God for them. And why? 
Because, for Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned. Maybe they sinned and they cursed God in their hearts. And thus Job did continually. So he was always interceding. And who was he interceding for? His family. He was interceding for his family. For his children, yes. In case they would have sinned, he wanted to protect them. So Job was a noble person. But then in verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan, an accuser, came also among them. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So God is proud of Job. And he says, hey, look, here's an example of somebody that is on my team. You haven't, you don't have, he's speaking to Satan here. You don't have him in your grasp. He's on my team. He fears God and shuns evil. Oops. And in verse 8, no, sorry, in verse 9, then Satan answered and said, Oh, really? Does Job fear God for naught? Is it for nothing that, that Job fears you? Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Hast thou blessed the work of his hands and his substance? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and then you'll see his true colors. Then he will curse you to your face. So, the Lord said, Okay, all that he hath is in thy power. But, upon himself, put forth not thine hand. Put not forth thine hand. So, what happened? You know the story? All this calamity suddenly came upon Job, one after the other, in the same day, all of all that he had, including his sons and his daughters, were gone. They died, all his cattle were taken away, all his wealth was gone in a moment. And what, what did Job do? Verse 20, chapter 1, verse 20. Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not a bad response. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So Job passed the test. Very good. But that wasn't the only test. Chapter 2. There's another test. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came. Same situation. And again, in verse 3, the Lord said to Satan, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? He's my servant, Job. That there's none like him in all the earth. Perfect and upright man. One that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity. 
He holdeth fast his integrity. Pay attention to that. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. But Satan is not satisfied. He comes back. He's the accuser. That's what Satan means, the accuser. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. You still protected him. You still told me I can't touch his life, his body, his flesh. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bones and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. So God said, all right, have it your way, but save his life. So Satan uh, smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his crown. And he used his wife in verse 9. His wife said to him, Do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but Job said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Job is answering well. And it says, In all this did not Job sin with his lips. So Job, so far, is doing very well. And then Job's three friends come and they sat down with Job upon the ground seven days and seven nights just being there with him in his grief. Now, the story continues. In chapter 3, verse 1, after this, opened Job his mouth. You notice what it said previously. In all this, Job did not sin. How? Where did it go? He did not sin with his lips. He didn't. Sin with his lips. Now in verse 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. After this, opened Job his lips, his mouth. And what did he do? He cursed his day, that is, his birthday. Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born. So now we go into a long dialogue between Job and his three friends. And if you were to summarize it, Job is complaining about his circumstances. He's saying, hey, I did everything right. I hold on to my integrity, but yet I'm afflicted. This isn't right. Why is this happening? So look in Job chapter 27 and verse 5. He's having this dialogue with his friends because his friends have a different position. Job says, I've done right, but God is doing me wrong. I don't deserve this because I've done right. And his friends say, no, Job, 
you're not doing right. Because God only does that to people who do wrong. He only brings that kind of punishment to those who do wrong. And Job says in verse 4 of chapter 27, My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. So he's confident in what he's saying. God forbid that I should justify you. He's saying, no, it's not that I did wrong, because that was their argument. They were saying, you sinned somewhere. You just need to acknowledge it. You need to recognize your sin. And Job said, where is it? Where is my sin? And he said, God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. So Job held on to his integrity. Was Job innocent? God said that he was perfect and, and righteous and feared God, eschewed evil. And it said that he, first it said in all this, Job sinned not. And then the second time, it said he sinned not with his lips. And then it said he opened his mouth and he cursed. He cursed, right? He didn't curse God, but he cursed his birthday. Amen. That's a good point. Who gave him life? Who gave Job life? It was God. So he didn't directly curse God. But if you curse the day that you were born, because you were born then, he's, he's, cursing what God did. He's cursing the life that God gave. So that's indirectly cursing God. But it's not what Satan said. Satan said he will curse you how? Through your face, exactly. He didn't curse God to his face. But indirectly, he did curse God, because God, especially in this story, God takes responsibility for all of this evil that comes to Job. But Job, he, he does have a problem. And in the, the whole dialogue, through the, the whole book of Job, he is expressing his complaint to God. He's complaining and complaining. I did right, and God did me wrong. God, he's basically saying, he even says directly, yeah, I want to speak with God. I want to make my case before God because there's injustice being done. <coughs> and... He has a fourth friend. His, his three friends don't get it. But he has a fourth friend who understands. In Job chapter 32, these three men cease to answer Job. Why? Because he was righteous in his own eyes. He didn't see anything wrong in himself. And they were saying, there is something. They, they held to their story, there's something wrong with you, Job, but they couldn't identify it. Then was kindled in verse 2, the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel. Also against, uh, sorry, against, against Job, 
was his wrath kindled? Because he justified himself rather than God. So he said, I am right. I've done good things in my life, and God is wrong because I'm being judged wrongly. And also against his three friends was Elihu's wrath kindled because they found no answer. And this is an important point. They found no answer and yet had condemned Job. So if we can't answer something, we shouldn't condemn because you're assuming then that you're correct in your understanding. And that's a theme in this book. It's about understanding the truth of this situation. It's a book of judgment. Discerning what the true reality is. So, up to this point, in the whole conversation of Job with his three friends, he's complaining and complaining and, and complaining. All right? And how does Elihu answer? Elihu, after explaining his case and why he's speaking now, because he's a young man and he had great respect for the older people who were who were in conversation, so he waited, but they had no answer. So then he says, okay, then I'll speak now. And he begins talking about God. Okay, here we go. He Starts more or less around in chapter 33 and verse 15 or 14. Yeah, around in this area. Okay, here we go. This is a key verse. In verse 12. Job 33, verse 12. Behold, in this thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. So, this is more or less a summary of Elihu's argument. He still doesn't have an answer that's very satisfying. But he says, you're not just because God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? And so he rebukes Job and he says, look, God is greater than you are. So, and he talks about God's works. He directs him to see the things in nature from the stars in heaven, from the, the clouds, how things work in nature. He directs him to God's works. And he contrasts that with Job and his ignorance. You don't know. You don't know what, how the things work in the world. You don't know how the clouds form or how the many different things in nature operate. You don't know. That was his point. God is greater than man. And because God is greater than man, you're not just to say you're right and God is wrong for, for allowing something to happen to you. Now, after Elihu explains his argument, then in Job Chapter 38, the Lord weighs in himself. It describes 
Elihu is continuing, and, and you can almost sense that he's describing the environment around him. He starts talking about the dark clouds, and it's like this storm is developing. And then in Job chapter 38, there's the Lord answering Job out of the whirlwind. So this whirlwind had formed, and God himself speaks to Job, and he said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? So does God have something against Job? This time he does. This time he's questioning Job. Who are you? Who is this that is darkening counsel? What does it mean to darken counsel? That means you're, you're clouding good judgment by words without knowledge. You don't understand. You're saying things, but you don't understand what is really happening. And so now God challenges him and he says, gird up your loins like a man. I will demand of thee and you answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. And he continues in the same line, just like Elihu did. And finally, Job answers. Sort of. After God says in uh, Job chapter 40 and verse 2, God says, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. So now Job is on the hot seat. <laughs> and Job answered the Lord and said, He said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. So Job realizes, okay, I'm stuck. I can't, I can't answer. But God's not satisfied with that. Then the Lord, then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind again and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. And so he continues a little bit longer, making similar arguments until in Job chapter 42, Job answers again, and he said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? So he's repeating God's question, now he's answering. Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I, de I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Now he's again, he's repeating God. He's saying, okay, you said you will speak and, and ask me, and you want me to answer you? Here's his answer. Verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. <clears throat> but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is the summary of Job's response. 
I abhor myself and repent. He repented. And then God was satisfied. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Now that's interesting. So the three friends of Job are rebuked now by the Lord because they have not spoken what was right. But then he says, you haven't done, you haven't spoken what was right like my servant Job has. My servant Job spoke what was right. You know, if that makes you scratch your head, <laughs> you're probably in good company. What is God referring to? That Job spoke what was right. Because he repented. Exactly. That. He recognized his condition and he abhorred himself. And he repented. That is the part that Job spoke right. It wasn't all his complaining throughout the book in his conversation with his three friends. That's not what God is referring to. He's referring to his repentance. And he's rebuking the friends. Why? They didn't repent. There's no word that the friends said anything. They stopped because Job was righteous in his own eyes, but when the Lord spoke, they didn't repent like Job did. So what did God tell Job? He's, uh, he's telling his three friends to go to Job with this offering, and Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So he reiterates that, and he makes them go with an offering, and Job intercedes for who? For his friends who came from different parts. Now contrast that with the beginning of the story. Who was Job praying for in the beginning? He was praying for his sons, for his family. Now he's praying for other people, his friends. And his friends each came from their own place, their own nation, far away. So he, his intercession now went outside of his family, his local unit, and now he's praying for others throughout the world. And God says, him will I accept. Why? Can you answer? Because he repented, exactly. And that is the story that we see in the sign of the Son of Man, it's the story of repentance. It doesn't mean, you know, Job had his faults, but he, it's important to understand, he held on to his integrity. That doesn't mean he was flawless. It doesn't mean he didn't make mistakes, but he held on to his integrity. How would we express that in a different way? He, his conscience was clear. He, he lived in a way that he had a clean conscience. And part of that was, part of having a clean conscience is 
when we're confronted with who we are, like Israel was confronted with the golden calf and, and Moses coming down and saying, you broke this and now he ground the golden calf in the powder and put it in the water and made them drink it. <laughs> they were confronted with that. And when they repented, God forgave them. Yes. Yes, when it's when when the law is written in the in the flesh, it's at the point of Yom Kippur, which you're saying points to that day when the high priest would would minister and cleanse the uh, the sanctuary from. Yes, he went into the most holy place and he interceded in in that place of incense. Remember, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. There was a cloud of incense when he would go there. That's the incense that represents prayer. It represents that intercession. He went before God and he interceded. And who did he intercede for? For his family? Or for, for all of Israel? And that's even symbolic for today where Israel is not the literal nation or a literal bloodline, but Israel represents all of God's people throughout the world, everyone who identifies themselves with him and who would join with Israel. So it's spiritual Israel. They are whom we should pray for. And what does Job tell us about that? It says he will hear, God will hear, uh, he will hearken to Job, who prays for his friends. My servant Job shall pray for you into the most holy place with the incense, praying for his friends, for God's people throughout the world. For Job will I accept. And if he didn't do that, the rest would not be saved because God would deal with them according to their folly. And that's not where we want to be. And we don't want anyone to be in that position. And so we pray for them. And that is our role as the 144,000 is to pray, to intercede for others so that they who, who don't repent, they don't do like Job, they don't say what is right, they don't repent in their heart. So he prays with them. And what is the modern equivalent? What's the reality that corresponds to that prayer? That's the prayer that the 144,000 make that is an intercession for his people that says, give them more time to bring their lives in order. And that prayer was made in 2016, right here on these grounds, just off the hill. That's a whole new subject, and it fulfills a different prophecy. But it's not just our prayer. I don't want to give that impression, because the Bible says it's the prayers of all saints in Revelation chapter 8. But they're, they're represented. All of those prayers of God's people are represented in the prayer that was made here for more time, which is part of that song. And therefore, it's, it's part of what comes out of this land of Paraguay. It has to do with what we read in Revelation 14. And I want you to notice, this is the contrast 
between Israel, who said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. We're going to do it. Now look at the 144,000. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. They don't do anything. They just, they just follow the Lamb. Imagine a Lamb walking around, and they're just following the Lamb. Yeah, doing something, but it's... it's have, you ever, have you ever traveled somewhere with a friend... And you're in the passenger seat. Your friend is driving along. And you, you get to the end. You get to your destination. And then maybe on the way back, they say, okay, now you drive back. It's a new place. And then you're, you're like, oh, oh, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> you know, you may not be able to, just because you got there, it doesn't mean that you could... Get yourself there. And that's how it is when you're in the, at least for me, when I'm in the passenger seat and somebody else is driving, I'm relaxed. You take me there. <laughs> you know how to get there. It's all fine. I'm just following. And that's, that's how it is. When we follow the lamb, he doesn't say where the lamb is going. He just says wherever he goes, they follow. He turns right. You go right. He turns left, you go left. Yes. So we follow, and then at every point, when the Lamb leads us to a situation, maybe it's a difficult situation, but we follow Him. We have that choice at every point to either follow Him or go our own way. But when we follow Him, that's keeping a clean conscience because it's in our mind where we make those decisions, where we follow the Lamb. It's on the little details of everyday life where we follow the Lamb. We know to do right, we follow the Lamb if we do it. But if we ignore that, that voice that says, go right, Go left, do this, do that, whatever it is. When we see the lamb going and then we want to go somewhere else, then we're not following the lamb and then we don't have a clean conscience. Then we have to repent. But we can still follow the course of Job we can still have that clean conscience once we repent. The problem is when we willfully depart from Christ and we say, but I don't want to go that way and I will go this way, then we no longer have a clean conscience. Okay, gone over time, but that's the lesson of the 144,000 contrasted where Israel said, whatever you said we will do, they will go in their own strength to do it, but they fell flat on their face. But following the lamb, it's effortless. They just watch. And it's, it's beautiful because, and this is why it's not really doing because the doing is when we go our own way. Then we do. But we're actually undoing. We're letting go when we go, when we follow Christ. We let our will go. We, we stop doing our will. And we just say, okay, Lord, I follow you. That's why it's not doing, but following. And that's the role of the 144,000 in these last moments of history. So with that, stand up and let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for your love, for your patience with us. You teach us through life's experiences. And you show us that no matter how terrible our circumstances, it is not honoring for you to complain, but to accept all things as from you, like Job originally did. And when we're tempted to complain about our circumstances and how hard life is and how it might seem to contradict our understanding, what we expect life to give, then we can look at your works. We can look up and see your heavenly works and your might and power that can only come from the Almighty, from him who knows the end from the beginning. And we can trust all, every detail of our lives to you and know that you will care for us as your children and as a loving father. And so we give you our praise, accepting both the good from your hands and the evil, trusting you that in all things, your name will be justified and cleared in the end. And in the end, we will understand that it was the best way according to your knowledge of the end from the beginning. So we praise you. We thank you for all that you allow to come into our lives. And we seek your honor as we follow you. We recommit our lives to you, to walk in your ways, to forsake our own course and surrender with repentance to you that we may be clean before you and walk with your law written in our hearts. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the wounded one of Orion. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and we will see you again next week. Mm -hmm.